Yeah, get it on. Got to get on the church beginning of mandate. Get it on. And thanks for tuning in. Exciting today. Yes, I'm excited. Darius Rucker is here. Um, a guy I don't know, but I feel like I know you. <laughs> and I feel like I like you. So let's not screw this up. <laughs> yeah, let's not mess that up. <laughs> Early, so I uh, and uh, Dickie Barrett's going to join us later from the uh, Boston's and Pete Parada from uh, the Offspring. So it's very musical uh, centric today. But so I had this revelation of ten minutes ago. I was standing here when they're telling me about Cracked Rear View yeah. and about how it went double diamond. Ten yeah. millions a ten, ten million units sold. That's twenty million. Yeah. Oh, twenty million. Oh, <laughs> yeah. diamond is ten. Twenty one times yeah. platinum. It's the nineteenth best selling album of all time in the United States. Wow! But didn't you tell me ten million sold? You said ten million. I sold said ten point two in the first year. Like oh, in the first year, and then it doubled again. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, cracked rear view. Yeah. I was sitting around North Hollywood is the only John Hyde fan in all <laughs> of the San Fernando Valley. And I kept listening to the radio. Now another hit from Cracked Rear View. And I go, Cracked Rear View? Where do I know that from? Yeah. Because I know that from something. That's where it's from. And then I'm like, I love John Hyatt. And Learning How to Love You is one of my favorite John Hyde Mine songs. Too. Because it's so simple. Yeah. And we'll we'll play the clip. But and then I thought, Hootie... Not that you are hooting, we'll get into that. But John Hyatt, a brother? That seems weird to me. <laughs> how? But how, how did he get that? Oh, man. I, I, ever since I was a kid, music was just music to me. I listened to whatever I, whatever I heard that I liked. And just in college, I got turned on to John Hyatt. And I mean, like you said, learning how to love you is just an amazing song. And. I just, I love him. He's such an amazing songwriter. He, we actually took him on tour. We'll play you a 30-second little snippet from that so you can hear it. So it's a line that always stood out yep. to me, and I always liked it, that he was living his life through a rearview mirror, yeah. and it was crap. that I was living in some cracked rear view. Well, you're going to play it from earlier, remember, Dawson? <laughs> I just wanted to hear the learn how to love this part. <laughs> Thank God I was there. In some uh, well, you can get your shit together, Dawson. I stood in the booth 10 minutes ago. and said, I know. We, we both me. agreed on starting it at 110, and I just started it at 110. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to pull it back. I'm going right. to pull it back. Here <laughs> we got- go. Was that I was Still living. not what I wanted, Dawson. That's it. That's but it. you can find that's it. That's actually it. Well, Oof, we're going to hear learning how to love you part. You want the chorus, because that's, 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 that's the second verse. Oh, the chorus, that's the second you verse. Wanted, yeah. You that's said start verse. it here in the instrumental part leading up to the second verse. You oh, said, I said in the clip. instrumental part. You you said play play that. St- listen here. I said I want to hear the chorus, and then I want to hear it go into the lyric. No, this all right. is, it's all ruined. All right. We got I Darius Rucker. Right. <laughs> Darius Rucker, he's, he's walking back to the cab. <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. We were They told us we had to name our record that day, and we had, didn't know what we were going to name it. And we, we were just listening to music, and that line hit, and everybody went, that's it. Correct review. You just that's knew. Yeah, yeah, everybody said that. What were some of the uh, the one the names that didn't make it? Do you remember? Oh God, I don't remember. We couldn't come up with anything good. <laughs> <laughs> they had love hurts. They had hell is for children. They had all the great lyrics. The white right. album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking about that. It was always vexing me, but we we didn't have the internet. Yeah. So I was just stumbling around the San Fernando Valley going, they got it from that song. <laughs> we definitely got it from that song. But I must have been the only person in the valley oh, no. that knew that. You were one of the only people anywhere to do that. There'd be people who still don't get it. Yeah. Um, so you guys start off, the, the band starts off in college, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone's just college friends. Yeah, I was 19 and Mark and Dean were 18. And we just met, we lived on the same dorm hall. Me and Mark lived on the same dorm hall and Dean lived upstairs. And we just... Really, uh, the, the way I was singing in the shower one day, I was singing Billy Joel's Honesty. I thought mm. everybody was in class, and I was right. just singing to the top of my lungs. And I came out, and he was standing there. Marks was standing there and said, I play guitar, and you want to see if we do any of the same songs later? And I was, yeah, and that, the band started that night. 
Honesty would have been a good name for the album, <laughs> too, though. That's true. <laughs> so it was completely organic. Totally. I mean, don't you think that there's a certain secret sauce and organic, like when, when people would say, oh, why was the man show so successful? I'd go, because me and Jimmy were friends yeah. and we wanted to do our own show. And they go, but it really dropped off after you guys left. I'm like, because they took two dudes <laughs> and they put them together. Yeah. Everything was the same, but you were missing the sort of secret sauce. You Absolutely. know, menudos just go get a 14 year old, bunch of 14 year olds, and shove them together. Yeah. You know what I mean? But you guys hung, you we, liked the same music, you were friends. Yep. And we played for seven years, eight years before we had a record deal. It, it was just, we played a lot of shows. And and we, like you said, we were just friends, man. We were, we were hanging out, drinking beer, and said, let's start this band. And we did, and just kept, kept on it until it happened. Was it covers at the beginning? Oh yeah, oh, we. I think there was one moment in our set where we played thirteen REM songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we were a cover band when we started. And was country and folk sort of stuff like kind of always in the back of your mind? Yeah, we kind of you know we always played kind of like you know the Hank Jr. songs and all that stuff back in the day, and it was always something that I liked a lot. Yeah, that, I didn't really think I was going to sing it until Randy Foster came along, but it, 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 it's always been around. Caroline's Boy is uh, the name of the album I should tell people, which is uh, available for pre-order right now as you hear this. It's Caroline, com- right? Oh, yeah, Car- sorry. Caroline. Caroline okay. Sorry. Caroline's Boy. Thanks. Uh, available for pre-order now. It's coming out October 6th, but well, let's get it and pre-order it. Um, what's the difference between like the old crowd and the new crowd? Oh, the country yes. crowd and the hootie crowd? They're, bas- they're basically the same. Oh, really? I really believe that all those, you know, all the people that were listening to Hootie back in the day are country fans now, just because there's so much little guitar on pop radio. You know, yeah. it's, all, it's also urban and, and poppy, and not a lot of guitar. And I think people still come are coming from Hootie and and Dave Matthews and those bands and coming over and listening to country music. Well, we were just talking that on on the Billboard chart right now, the top four songs are, are country, country artists. What do you attribute this renaissance in country music to? Oh man, I, I think you know it's, it's always been a great touring business. You know, I just think right now people, like I said, I think people looking for guitar, looking for stories, and that's what they're getting in country music. And you know, those guys are selling a lot of records. If I may, uh, one of the things that I always look for in music is a person, a guitar, and a point. Yeah. And if you have all of that, then I'm going to follow you. And then. You know, you look back several years ago when there were two kinds of music, country and, and Western. Western. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, the Eagles were more like Western. Absolutely. Or, you know, uh, Waylon was Western. Yep. Um, but I think the same thing is happening now with, you know, acoustic rock. It just folds so nicely into country music. And country music these days isn't what country music oh, was not. a long time ago. And it's it's a yearning for that. Definitely not. And I think that's why it, it transitions so smoothly. I think a cracked review came out today. It'd have to be a country record. There'd be, it, no, there'd be would, no place for it. It would be called. It would yeah. be designated yeah, a country, country record. Name. Absolutely. Yeah. So I had this and a more sociological uh, discussion about this. I wasn't talking about talking to my son about country music, was yeah. I? Oh, yes. right, did I? Yeah. Yeah. We had a whole discussion about it, and everyone in high school listens to country music, and I was like. You guys were listening to Tupac like ten seconds ago. Yeah. It doesn't sound like a California thing, right? A California high school listening to country. Well, what it is is it's it's rich white kids who will go whatever direction the nation sends them. Yes. You know what I mean? So if if whatever the culture is, that's where they'll go. So it doesn't really make sense for them to listen to rap and Kanye nonstop either, but that's what they listened what they to do. three years ago yeah. because the, the culture said, go here, listen to this. Mm-hmm. And because everything in high school is about – Every girl is trying to get popular, and every guy is trying to bang the popular girl. That's all of them. It's the chicks, and then all the guys who want to bang the chicks, and now it's that's the entire high school. Yeah. And they're all listening to. They were all listening to Kanye West two and a half years ago, and now they're all listening to country, which means something in our society is kind of nudging them that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot. I, I think a, some of it for country is the artists that are coming out like you know guys like Morgan and those guys that are coming out putting out these you know Zach Bryan and those guys putting out these monster records. You know that that's that's bringing the younger the the kids in because they're relating to them. I think as people also. 
You know, yeah. it's not just a bunch of old fogies like me out there <laughs> making records. But you were you were shrewd and kind of early money to transition X amount of years ago. Oh yeah, it was it was the right move. You know, uh, you know, we were sitting in a bus one day, and one of the guys in the band said they didn't want to be a touring band anymore. And one and, of the blowfishers. Yeah, and so I, you know, I always wanted to make a country record, so I just decided right then I'll go to Nashville see if I get a record deal. Do, or is everyone in the band set for life? Basically, yeah, they're doing pretty good. I think everybody's doing fine. You know, we did that. Last, we did that tour in nineteen that was hugely su- successful. So you know, they 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 got you know we split everything right down the middle. So they did pretty good on that tour. And and, and but uh, yeah, I think everybody's okay. Nobody's complaining. So yeah, they're doing okay. It's uh, it's nice because oftentimes there's acrimony. Yes. And it's so it's so weird and sad. Is that is that because you split everything down the middle? Because I always hear it's money that really divides a lot of bands. Music. And we did this because we saw bands that we loved. This happened to a lot of bands. You know, one guy or two guys will write all the songs, and they make they make all the real money. Well, back then, before streaming, that you know, then the songwriter would make all the money. And you could see these lead singers and songwriters who were rich, and their band members were getting day jobs where they were off because they just had the touring money, and. We just decided early on that we were going to split everything. Like, I wrote Let Her Cry by myself. You know, me and Mark wrote Only Want to Be With You, but everybody got, got, we split it four ways. So everybody could be equal in the band. Yeah. And there's, but there's also something that's sort of beyond money, which is like every comedy team ends up despising each other at some <laughs> point. Bands end up, many bands yes. end up despising each other. Maybe it's a proximity thing. I mean, maybe human beings weren't meant to do what you're asking these people to do, which is sit on flights together, sit on hotel lobbies together, like literally cram people together. And yeah. it may, there may be something unnatural about it. I agree. I think one of the reasons that we still play and we still get along like as good as we do is, is because we stopped playing. Because when we stopped playing, it got to a point where it was a job. You know, we, we were going out every summer for two months, and you know whether we wanted to or not, we were going out and playing the festivals if we have to this year and all that stuff. And it it was a job. And when we if we had kept doing that, I think we would have started resenting each other a lot. Did you take any crap like being black and? leading a band that was considered kind of, oh, that's a soft college. That's not Constantly. a black man's world. Come on. And then, <laughs> and, then, and then you went and did country, and people were like, come on, man. That's Constantly. not what you're supposed to be doing. Not, not just people, like my family, you know, my cousins and stuff would always would always give me they'd give me so much shit, man. You know, I'm sitting in the I'm sitting in my living room listening to the Rolling Stones and, and listening to Charlie Pride, and, and they're walking and go, what are you listening to this white boy shit for? Take it off, turn it off, turn it off. And much to my chagrin, one of the reasons my name, the name of my record is Careless Boy is my mom just would never have it. Like she would, if, it, if she heard anybody say anything to me, she'd light into him, let him listen to what he wants to listen to. You know, and she would let me listen to Kiss as long as she could. And when she couldn't take it anymore, she could come and put Al Green on. <laughs> but, uh, but, she didn't, your mom didn't like lick it up? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Screamed at her over and over again? <laughs> just for a little while. <laughs> Most middle-aged women of color love that song, so I'm surprised. It's their anthem. It's their anthem. Yeah. You hear it blaring from their Denali's. <laughs> lick it up. Ugh. Worst song ever. Well, that's the whole thing. I like lyrics. Yeah. So I would listen to John Hyatt yeah. on my own, and then I'd turn the radio on, and I'd yell, these middle-aged guys yelling, lick it up over yeah. and over again. I was like, come on. We're smarter than this, aren't we? Yeah. But, you know, I took a lot of crap. Yeah. The whole time. You know, we crazy stuff. Like, you know, playing a frat house in, in Tennessee, the KA house in Tennessee, you know, and we kill this crowd. And then there, there's four of us. Like five of us in a whole frat. So it's not like we're going to fight these guys. And they're sitting there calling me the N-word right there. Just stand right there. White guys? Yeah. What the? Yeah. And, you know, it's like crazy. We're like, we just killed you guys. Y'all are so happy. Y'all gave us a 500 yes. bucks extra. So <laughs> the, oh, yeah. the black and the white community did oh, not approve nobody, no. of you playing music that wasn't, but they didn't assume you should be playing. No. This, this is one of those things when I say this, it's just... It's a, for me, growing up the way I grew up, you know, when I grew up, Ebony and Jet was in every barbershop, and we saw it constantly. Mm-hmm. All I've done in music, and I've never been on the cover of either one of those magazines. 
Oh, oh, that is interesting because it's like they will they'll do that stuff all the time where they'll be like one of those magazines and they'll go, we're giving the top 50 uh, most influential black women or something like that. Mm-hmm. But they won't put Condoleezza Rice on there. Yeah. Like they won't put anyone conservative on on that list. They they don't they're they're sort of shunned or sort of persona non grata. Like they will never include blacks that got out of their lane. Yeah. Which is a bigger and more interesting issue to me, which is to I, me too. I was saying to Dr. Drew today when I was driving in, I started as a joke, but but now it's not a joke anymore. When I was talking to him about the real white privilege, and the real white privilege is not being in a group. Yeah, okay. I don't have to agree yeah. with some guy like, oh, don't fuck with Ryan Seacrest. That's my boy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't give saying. a shit with white yeah. Ryan. I, and then I get to go, oh, I think I like that guy. Like, I like Tucker Carlson. And then I go, I don't like, uh, you know, Joe Biden. Or yeah. I don't like that white. I, I, no group. No pressure. And we're talking about the black community and the sort of pressure to like, you got to vote for this guy, otherwise you ain't black. Or you have to do, or if we start talking about family and education and that's a white thing and you don't want to be called white because you're stunning and stuff like that. I'm like, that's a lot of pressure for a a group. It is. And it's unnecessary too. Yeah, I agree with you. It is. And it's, you know. It affected you. Know, it affect my career. It affects everything. It affects everything about you. And because you're right, you know, if you don't, if you're not doing what we're supposed to do, then you don't get the. I don't think you get the love that you deserve. You know what I mean? I don't think right. you get the respect that you deserve because you're not doing what we're supposed to do. Like me, I'm singing the white boys' music. I'm singing the one. You know, I'm just singing music, man. You know, have you heard me? Have you heard my <laughs> voice? I'm supposed to be singing this stuff. <laughs> well, I I think that's. You know, I think that's the problem, which is we're supposed to be heading toward you're not supposed – the the utopia is you're not supposed to care what color the person is. You yes. know, the content of the character, not the color of the skin. And yet we've tripled down on trying to shove people into different lanes. And, you know, it's like – was it Morgan Freeman who was just sort of like, I don't want Black History Month. There's yeah. no Jew History Month. What do we, what, stop separating. Like, let's, yeah. let's stop it. Let's get back into the melting pot theorem. And I don't know how it would work if you kept saying there's this group, there's that, there's the LGBT plus community, and there's a Latinx community, and there's African American community, and there's a gay African American. Like, how would this work of getting – how can we get everyone together if we're creating 18 separate groups? Yeah, I agree. You know, uh, that's – and and every time you look at all this stuff, and the one thing that I always say, and I say to my kids, you know, we, you're, you're doing all this this grouping and clicking up, but basically, you know, we all just have to live in the same place. We, we, we all have to live here. We're going to eat at the same restaurants. We're going to, you know, go to the same places. It's like it, – it's sad, but it's the American way. Yeah, but it, it also, it feels like we're being manipulated a little bit. Yeah. Like it feels like somebody's pulling some levers, you know, and yeah. trying to sort of keep this group here and pit that group against this group. I think it, it's better for them. when It's better for, for all politicians to keep us separated. It's better. Cause they, right. Because it's, it's for, for what they want to do, it's, let's keep them separated and keep them fighting. Then we can keep our gigs. Right. And what you also do is you go, well, I'm going to separate all the groups, and then I'm going to explain what I'm going to do for that group, depending on which group I'm in front yeah. of. Although yeah. they can never do anything for that group because they don't have the power yeah. to do something for that group. Yeah. Yeah. Must have been, uh, I mean, it had to be kind of bittersweet for you touring around having amazing success but also sort of being the butt of jokes on SNL and that sure. kind of stuff. It, it was it was but you know I always say in the, when when times like that like the SNL skits and all that stuff I must have really made a difference cuz you don't get on those shows if you're not somebody, you know? And so I could take a joke but it was just what it is and and you know, I just wanted to sing what I was singing. You know, I found three be- three dudes I wanted to play with, and I just wanted to play what we were, whatever we were going to write, and that was going to be rock and roll. Yeah, it's kind of sad. 
in that I'll sometimes, first off, if one of the old songs comes on, don't change it. I'm, I'm listening. Yeah. They named their album after John Hyde's <laughs> lyrics, so I am now dedicated. I'm listening, but I'm, I'm like, oh, that sounds good, and your voice is really good, but I never heard anyone mention your name with the pantheon of these guys. Oh, this guy's got chops. You know, he can, yeah. he can sing, and I realize now that's just kind of because we're snobs. Yeah, you know, and the thing about us is we had that our whole career, so once we made it big, we were not surprised that, you know, out, that wasn't going to happen for us. Because we... You gotta, when we were coming up to the clubs was when grunge hit. Oh, and man, we were man. everything but grunge. You know, it was grunge and that white boy rap stuff that everybody mm. was that those rock and roll bands were doing. Right. You know, then Hootie would come into the club playing the little pop songs, and and you know, the line would be out the door, and everybody would be angry at us. But it, it was like so. You know, like we wouldn't even write our name on walls at, in bars where everybody writes the name because we knew when we came back it would just be a bunch of shit talk right next to it. So we, oh, right we just wouldn't even write our name on the wall. <laughs> we should stop doing that at the comedy clubs. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, they always ask you to sign, sign, the, the, wall. Oh, yeah. Yeah. sign the wall. Yeah. Um, so you grew up not thinking so much about music but thinking more about sports? No. Well, you know, I... I thought, like every kid from six to thirteen, I thought I was going to play in the NFL. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, that, at thirteen, I realized I wasn't going to play in the NFL. But I really only singing is the real thing I've wanted to do since I was four. You know, since I heard Al Green for the first time and realized I could get up and hold a salt and pepper shaker as my microphone and <laughs> sing it. That this is all I've wanted to do, really. How did you grow up? Did you grow up? I grew up poor. You know, my mom was a nurse, and she had five kids. That was well until I was eleven. Then she had six, and. You know, sometimes we, you know, it was, oh, I always say this all the time. I do my childhood again. It, 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 I didn't realize what it was until I was gone. You know, but there were times we didn't have dinner or didn't have food to eat. But that was just the way we lived. And, you know, you know, I remember they have, you know, getting the eviction notices and all that stuff before finally getting to pay the, the bill. But uh, it is, we grew up in a little, nice little neighborhood that was a village. And, like, I'm still best friends with the, the guys I grew up in that neighborhood. So when you say you do your childhood again, I might do my childhood again, but I'd have to know where I was going to end up because <laughs> I was miserable thinking where I was going to end up. And that was somewhere other than this. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the part. I think I would have had a much better time in my life if someone just tapped me on the shoulder and went, here's a shot of you at age 35, here's where you're going to live, this is the car you're going to drive, yeah. so on and so forth, I would have went, oh, well, then I can suck this up for a while. <laughs> but I thought I was destined to be poor and miserable. Yeah. So would you do your childhood again? Sure, knowing you're going to blow up when you're 23. Absolutely. Or 27. Yeah. yeah, I would do it then. I, I, I would I, I do it, I get. I would do it anyway. It was, it, it was such fun. I, I always look back as like, because, you know, back then it was different now. It wasn't any video games or anything. It was a bunch of kids outside, you know, riding their bikes for 10 miles, and, you know, just and coming back home. And it was, I, I loved it. I loved my childhood. I still, my sister still lives in the house I grew up in. I always go in the neighborhood and hang out. It's, I love it. How did your family do with your riches? Because that can be, <laughs> I'll just say this. I have not met a successful person who came from the wrong side of the tracks, who when I bring up family and money, they just make a face. <laughs> I did something that was smart, and I don't know why I thought of doing this, but I did this. when, when After the Letterman show and things started to take off, some, we were having a family gathering or something, and I went in, and I just said to my brothers and sisters that uh, we aren't getting rich. I said, I'm getting rich. <laughs> And I said, I will. I, I love you guys, and I'll never, I'll never let you lose your house. I'll never let you lose a car. I'll, if your kid needs something, I will be here for you. But if you think you're going to change your lifestyle, that's just not going to happen. And they understood, and you know, I've, I've stuck by that. You know, I'm always there for them, and they know they can always call me. But I'm not. I wasn't going to change anybody's lifestyle, and, and that's the way we've lived it. Um, getting back to just being out, we're the same age, and. That's all I was. I was just out wrestling, riding the bikes, yeah. throwing rocks and stuff. You know, football just, in the just street, man. Football in the street. Whatever the season was, yep. that's what you played. And I was sort of thinking about everyone kind of going insane these days. 
and realizing we've removed ourselves from the sort of physical, tangible world, and we're on to some cyber world or some digital world, yeah. and we're not meant to be there. We're supposed to be rolling around in the dirt oh, and yeah. wrestling and taking chances and jumping our bikes and doing all <laughs> whatever on your skateboard, yep. like whatever, taking chances, get scrape it, getting yeah. your knees scraped up, um, and and working. Like working, working yeah. outside, tilling soil, building a barn, you know, and we've lost our way and we've lost our logic because all those things I just discussed, you need logic. Yeah. You cannot just get on a bike with no brakes and go find the steepest hill in the county. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. You have to really weigh things and work things and, and a lot of problem solving along oh, yeah. the way. And I don't know how we regain that because everyone is going, you know, there's no industry, there's no factories, there's no build. Everyone's just moving inside and sitting yeah. in a cubicle and they've lost their ability to reason. It feels like to me. And kids aren't like doing all those things you said. I mean, kids are sitting in their house playing video games and, and it's like, I, I don't know how we get the logic back. I don't know how we get the reasoning back. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, this, you know, every generation changes, I guess. And that's what we're seeing. That's what I think we're seeing now. And, and it's, you know, you, you sit back and go, wow. I mean, it's crazy. But you're right. Everybody's in a cubicle now. Everybody's, you know, nobody. It just seems like it's so, and we sound like those old curmudgeons, you know. It, like, it's just so different. No, no I, I know we, we sound old, but it's sort of like saying, you know, this guy saying the way to lose weight is diet and exercise. Oh, come on, you old fart. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but it works. I mean, it's still, it may be old. Yeah. It may be boring. But it worked. Yeah, I agree. So you grew up with quite a few brothers and sisters and a mom, like a yep. single mom? Single mom, yep. Where was dad? Uh, dad was around, but wasn't really around. I, I don't. I didn't see dad. That went, I went, this is my, this is one of those stories when you hear it, you can't even believe it. But I didn't see him for 15 years. From, what age, okay. from like what age? I was what age? 12 to 27. I didn't see him. And <laughs> oh. I, before that, I might, I might have seen him once a year. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And I didn't see him for 15 years, and we do Letterman, and everything takes off, and we decide we're going to finish these clubs that we used to play. We're not going to cancel them. We're going to play them all and give so them one big You could have played night. bigger right. venues. But, but they were so good to us, we were like, we'll play, give you one last big play. Small rooms. Yeah. And so we're playing a place in Charleston, and I'm sitting there, and he walks in. Like like you saw me yesterday. He just walks in, and he sits next to me. And I, I decide I'm going to be the big man. I'm talking to him. I, Give my phone number and everything. So let's get together, man. Everything. I go home. I play the show that night and go home. And on my answering machine, it's him asking me for fifty thousand dollars. Wow! <laughs> I was like, "Are you joking right now?" He wasn't at the barbecue. <laughs> no. He didn't get the speech. He, he wasn't at the barbecue. He didn't hear. He didn't hear the speech. No, I couldn't believe it. I was like, "Wow!" Did well, it? But in a way. Like sometimes people do you a favor because they just tell you who they are from Jump Street. I mean, him abandoning the family, yeah. that that's what I would call a tell. But hey, could I have 50 <laughs> yeah. grand just from Jump Street, right? First thing. And then you get to go, all right, fuck this guy. Absolutely. But if he was more nuanced, and started saying, you know, I had a problem with alcohol, and I, I always thought about your boy, and blah yep. blah blah. Then you would have to wrestle yeah. with your thoughts, and you'd have, you know, you'd have resentment. But then another part of you would be going, "That's your dad, and yep. he's repentant." And then at some point, he'd still ask for the fifty grand. <laughs> but if he was smart, he'd do the long play. You, you know, he's into it. Exactly. He's in. It. Yeah, you can't just dump right in there. <laughs> yeah, start with a six pack, and then and then just sort of dovetail it yeah. into, yes. the, into exactly. the fifty grand. So you didn't really have to go through that. Yeah, you're, you're just absolutely like, who, right. That's who he is. You're like, well, that's the. You know, see you later, man. You know. And and no no more after no more thoughts. After I would. That? Yeah, I'd see him every now and then. You know, we lived we lived in the same town. Another great story. I'm walking down King Street in Charleston, and he's driving towards me, and he's got this white guy in the seat, and I realize he's past driving a Cadillac, and he pulls up, and he sees me, and he pulls on the side. He's like, "Oh God, it's so good. God sent you to me today." I said, "Billy, if you think God sent me to buy you that." <laughs> car you are on crack <laughs> there's no fucking way i'm buying you that car I was, I was like you are something man and i and that, that time i probably hadn't seen him in three years really yeah I probably it was three years i hadn't seen him and that, that's what he he pulled up and expected me to buy him a car and where is he still with us no no he died a couple years ago but you know he was 
I always say I'm the father I am because he was such a such a shitty father to me. That uh, you and know, my, that made me really. Want and my you kids. consider yourself a good father? I try to be. Because I, I, I talk to some of your kids. So <laughs> 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 like I think they fair to Midland. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they have a prepared statement, <laughs> and they thought this would be the form to do it in. <laughs> That's pretty good. They would think this is the form to do it in. <laughs> I. Well, okay. Lots of thoughts. Uh, yes. One is is. Yes. Why can't more people just have a shitty childhood and though and then go, I'm not going to be that way with my kids. Why does everyone go, Well, he didn't know his dad, so you know, he had a bunch of kids and then he did it the same thing. It justifies you to be yeah, a shitty dad. Why person. does that yeah. justify I anything? Agree. You got a front row seat to a shitty dad. Yep. I got a front row seat to family, you know, that don't hug or tell you they love you or yeah. are positive or bring laughter or anything. So I'm like I'm going to have fun with my kids. I, I'm going to be what I wanted them to be. Yes. Uh, that's not a message that m people can easily get. Why do so many people go the other direction? That's a good question. I don't know. That's a great question. And I, I, I like, we, like you were saying, it's an excuse. And, you know, if everybody can, if, they, if people can use that excuse, well, my dad was shitty, so I'm, that's why I'm the way. No, you know, I'm with you 100%. You know, I, I, you would think most of the time we would go the other way. But also the message for people that want to do well or make money is like, don't get grabby early. You know what I mean? Just show up, be yep. consistent, be of service, be around. I mean, I'm sure if your dad was hat in hand, repentant and consistent and did a bunch of stuff and took you out to lunch and said, I'm buying, you know, yeah. a few times and sort of played the long game with you, at some point, if he needed something, I would have given it to him. you would have definitely right. stepped up. <laughs> Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. It was, a shock, it was shocking to me that after 15 years, we had a three-minute conversation, and he thought it was okay to, to <laughs> ask me for that. Yeah. Well, he would say, and society would say, well, he didn't know his dad either, <laughs> but go back to what I just said. Yeah. So... Um, and was it always, was there always, I don't know, a hole in your heart, so to, sp so to speak? I mean, was it always? It was, but but not, I had some really great people, like in my neighborhood, my best friend's dads, who were who were always there for me as fathers. Like, I remember getting in trouble in school one day, and my brother come and go, Mr. Campbell's at the door, and I went to the door, and Mr. Campbell let me have it. I mean, <laughs> he, he let me have it, you know, and I deserved it, you know, because I didn't have a dad to do that. And, but he was, you know, like I said, we had a village. You know, our neighborhood was a village. And, and I had a, a few dudes in that neighborhood who, try, who treated me like their son. Was it a black neighborhood, a black white neighborhood, neighborhood? All black, all black. And what? It's not anymore, but it was when I was there. <laughs> was, uh, well, that's why your sister's still there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so... So some sometimes you hear. I mean, you're not that old, but I mean, you hear about people that grow up in an all black environment that go somewhere and they're dropped out, dropped in with a bunch of white people, and they go, "I've never met a white person." Oh, yeah. yeah, well, we had school. Our schools were always integrated, so you know, we had we always had a group of friends that were it was very diverse. You know, even though even back then, so it, you know, for me, and then you know, you go to University of South Carolina, there's thirty five thousand white people. <laughs> you know, and and so you go there, and you're just around a lot of white people, and they were decent, except for that one frat. Some decent, except well, there was a couple frats, but, <laughs> but most people were pretty decent. Yeah, was it? Uh, did you guys ever? I mean, the success. I mean, uh, Double Diamond is not really imaginable. I guess when you're starting off oh, as no. a band, was the goal just to just to be employed? The goal was just get a record deal and just see, see, you know, just. Get a record deal. Get to make a couple of records. Hopefully, have a little bit of success, and we can, you know, we can play bigger shows. How'd that come about? Uh, we well, grunge was king, like I said, and uh, nobody was really looking for a band like us. And we put out a, a, a an EP called Coochie Pop, and uh, we sold like sixty five thousand copies out of just out of out of our band in wow. these mom and pop stores. And so Billboard, when Billboard, before the Billboard turned to computers, they'd call the store and you'd give them your Billboard Top 50. And uh, so they were calling these stores in, in the Carolinas and we, you know, we were three in some stores, you know, four in some stores selling records. And people started looking at the charts going, who was the Hootie and the Blowfish band outselling you two down in South Carolina? <laughs> you know, and then they came down 
And everybody tried to sign us, but uh, Atlantic was where we decided to go. And was there records before Crack Review? Uh, just Coochie Pop and another but that was little a single, EP. Right? Yeah, that was I, I think five songs. Oh, two, oh yeah, sorry. five songs. Like we had two five song things we put out before that. But mm-hmm. That was it. That was it. Yeah. And it did anyone in the band sort of freak out over the massive success? No, no, we partied. I'm gonna tell you that the party was stupid. The party was, <laughs> the party was like it was stupid. But no one, fr- all we saw was, the, was that the st- was that the shows were getting bigger. It, mm-hmm. it wasn't like we, uh, we 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 had we were such an insulated group. The four of us were always together. We you, you couldn't even wear a black t shirt without being called out. You know, it was right. that kind of thing. We were just always giving each other shit and always trying to keep each other grounded. So nobody ever really freaked out. How outrageous were the parties? Like what was like what's an example oh uh, oh we were, we were at the chateau marmont and uh we're having this party we're, it's it's i mean it's just a bunch of people there we're having this great party and it's going it's hard and all of a sudden these two girls get on the table and they just start going at it and we're i'm you know high as i could be we're just messed up and i'm standing there with woody harrelson and my buddy and we're standing there and i go woody i'm from south carolina man this doesn't happen he said, bro, I'm from L.A. This doesn't happen. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I mean, we just, it was non. The thing for us, it was nonstop. Like, it was, we were never not partying. I mean, I used to drink a bottle of Jim Beam a day. Every really? day. Every day. I, my liver was five times the size when I had to go get, like, I had to go t- get tested for life insurance. And they were like, dude, you know, the doctor was like, you got to stop. I was like, all right. I stopped for a couple months and went right back to it. It was crazy. Oh, are you sober now? Not sober. I mean, I still you know have some drinks and everything. I don't do the uh, the uh, extracurricular activities anymore. But I like really cocaine. Do. Yeah, too. Tons of it. Yeah, all that stuff. Just is it unavoidable? Unavoidable at that I, level? I don't. It's at that level. It's going to be around you somewhere. Somewhere you know when you get to where I am now, like they'll just know we're all just too old to want to do it. But back when you're 27 and. You know, you're about to be the biggest band in the world for a minute. Man, it's everywhere. I guess what it happens, I guess what happens is you go, cocaine's like, because you want to stay up all night. I sit around trying to figure out ways to go to bed earlier. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe I'll change the clock and fool, fool myself or put some foil up on the window so I can't see the light streaming through. Like I sit around and dream about ways to go to bed earlier. And then there's also that same thing with women. It's like you could have 10 women. It's like I want half a woman. <laughs> <laughs> One sounds like too tall in order at this at this point. Yeah, exactly. So I want to want to go to bed at nine, and I want to want to half a woman in yes, bed at this point I'm with, with you. me. But you guys all made it through generally unscathed. When we talk, that's the one thing that we always laugh about and say thank God about is that we all made it out of that. Like you know, a couple you know, a couple of us quit drinking and all that stuff, but. It, it was. We all made it out the side. We all got lucky. We made it out the other side. It could, yeah, it could have been a disaster at any point. To be honest with you, did it ever affect your shows or plan? Or I'm sure, I'm sure. You know, I'm, I'm sure that stuff's bad for your vocal cords. You know, and you're out there, you know, gacking up a couple lines before you go on stage. That that's not going to make you sound like Pavarotti. That's for sure. Mm. I um, it's it's so interesting because we're so superficial is sort of Americans that I would, I pictured you guys like eating candy corn and <laughs> drinking a knee high grape soda and going to bed early. Cause who's eating the blowfish? This is the nice guys. They're, they're, that was yeah. part of our persona. I, that was one of the reasons I think we, that was, that helped off success is we were the guys you think you could just go sit down and have a beer with. You just the nice guys, you know, they're not out there doing that crazy stuff, you know? And, and, uh, you know, we didn't play it out. We were just who we are, who we are. But it was that, that's always been our persona, and you know, we're okay with that. I think we can play a little clip from the uh, new album. By the way, this is uh, "Beers and Sunshine." Speaking of beers or booze yeah. or something, is that uh, where do you live? I live between Charleston and Nashville. Yeah, that, 
That makes sense. Yeah. Because I was talking to someone on the way, and I go, where does he live? And he said, not L.A. <laughs> He's not an L.A. guy. There's oh. no way. He's probably, I said, probably Nashville. And he said, yeah. no, nah, he's probably in Charleston. And yeah. then. Those two. There you go. Yeah, Charleston and Nashville. So in this album, you worked with Ed Sheeran. Yeah. You co-wrote a song. Yeah, yeah, we wrote a bunch of songs, but one of them on this record, yeah. How does your songwriting style differ with his, and how do you how do you meld them together? Oh, I mean, it's, it, you know, we just sat down and. Had guitars. It wasn't really the styles weren't really different. Ed, Ed, the song that's that's on the record. Ed, uh, Ed asked me who my first love was. We probably wrote five songs that day, and he asked me who my first love was, and I said this is my fifth grade girlfriend Sarah. And we went the whole day, and he kept asking me things about her. Kept asking me things about her, and I, and we finished like the fourth song, and I was like, all right, we're good, you know, and let's go drinking. And he was like, I got one more, one more, and he had this idea to write the song, and it was just. I mean, when he sang that little snip that he had before we started writing, it was just, I realized this kid is just a six, six, six songwriter. But, but that's, you know, that's how things come about. And, you know, Ed, I've known Ed since the Taylor tour, so he, he's, watching him blow up is pretty incredible. Oh, that. Yeah. Mm. Well, whatever happened to Taylor Swift? That's the real <laughs> question. Here. Sarah, now, the black community I'm does not approve <laughs> this song. <laughs> <laughs> they like the balls deep stuff, not the <laughs> sitting and talking. <laughs> that is the realm of the white man. That is, oh, I'd like to get to know you. Yes, I would. That's, That's not Al Green. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Who's my absolute idol, by the way? Yeah, he's he's great. Great voice. Um, all right, I know you got a hardish out, right? Because you got another uh, interview somewhere. I think so. So I'm not going to piss off your publicist. <laughs> but I think this went well. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed your show. I'm glad I got to be on it. I think there's you know enough here for a second date. Absolutely. I'd like to have another date with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can just talk like you did in that last song exactly. and hold hands. Beautiful, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I don't care if you're married. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, come back or Zoom in or something and we'll uh, continue the conversation. Would love to. Uh, oh, sorry, I can put my glasses on. Carolyn's Boy, I said that right yeah, or I yeah, screwed up the first right. time and the second you. time. Carolyn's Boy, it's available right now for pre order and it's coming out October 6th. But let's pre order it and then it'll show up right when it comes out, right? Absolutely. Darius Rucker, that was uh, a fine interview. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. We'll take a uh, quick break and then we'll come back with uh, Dickie Barrett and uh, Pete Parada right after this. Blinds Galore. Wow, I love these guys. Have a huge Labor Day sale. It starts Wednesday, August 30th. All custom blinds, shades, and shutters up to 50% off, half off. Mm hmm. You worked hard all summer. Reward yourself with custom window coverings from Blinds Galore during one of their biggest sales of the year. First place you go to buy custom window treatments and do it online. Trust me, they know what they're doing. I'm all I do. The only blinds I've ever bought are from Blinds Galore. And it's all like, I'm, I got a new order coming in. So I'm actually getting on the phone with them right after this. Family owned and run, celebrating 25 years of business, designer quality, window coverings without the designer price. And if you have any questions, their expert customer care team will help you every step of the way, either online or over the phone. It's Blinds Galore. Right, Dawson? You work hard enough. Let Blinds Galore make it easy to get the custom blinds and shades you want in your home. Check out BlindsGalore.com during their huge Labor Day sale and let them know that Adam sends you. That's BlindsGalore.com. Let me tell you about Angie, homeowners. You know, it's a lot of work to own a home. Whether it's uh, everyday maintenance, repairs, or dream projects, it can be hard to even know where to start. All you need is Angie. Your home for everything home. Find a skilled local pro who will deliver quality and experience. Over 20 years of home service experience. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie handles the rest. Look, you're busy. You don't have time to do all this stuff. Let Angie handle it. Take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Download the free Angie mobile app today. Or visit online. Visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I 
dot com. A N G I dot com. That's Angie. Let them do all the heavy lifting. The first single from our, our next guest, Dickie Barrett, is here. Pete Parada is here as well. The album, debut album from the new band, The Defiant, is out. Uh, it'll be released October 2023. So, all right, and that's the first soon. single. We'll tell you soon. Yeah, and so is uh, so is um, Darius Ruckers as well. Good to see you guys. Song. Yeah, hey, it sounded hey, Adam, great. How you been, buddy? Good. You can say it. I've done it again, right? You've done it again. <laughs> you know, to capture lightning in a bottle more than once is something That's that all a, I ever do. a man doesn't do over the course of a lifetime. But Dickie All Barrett. I have is one bottle and a shitload of lightning. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good song. That's a <laughs> That might be, hey, do we have time to change the album title? Yeah. Stop, Stop giving us away for free. <laughs> so, uh, Pete from the Offspring, uh, famously, formerly of the Offspring, form, oh, oh yes, fr from the Offspring, yeah, uh, formerly from the Offspring, uh, and I think people heard the story about uh, not getting vaccinated and being asked to leave the band, and yeah, and Dickie has his uh, own stories and trials and tribulations <laughs> with those themes as well. Uh, many yeah. do. I think has the dust settled on we were right or uh, no one's willing to circle back and say so though. I mean, I, I, I feel like we were, and, and I'll tell you something. I didn't want to be cause me being right meant there's going to be a lot of, um, of hard times and bad times. And, uh, but no one circled back and said, so there's a lot of looking at your shoes and like, it's a different time and we've moved on and Dickie read the room, that kind of stuff. But I, but I, yeah, you know, you know what? And I'm not, it, it's tantamount to this answer. Once I said to my sister more recently when she was talking about how I was cheap. Uh, and then I said to her, you know, I paid for the down payment of your first house and you never paid me back. And she said, Silver Lake. Yes. And she said, I thought I paid you back. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> she basically did. So that's what's happening to all of us who are, they attempted to destroy our lives for talking yeah. about facts about COVID. And now that it's done and they were wrong about everything, it's, I thought I paid you back. Anyway. Let's rewrite history. Yeah. You know, did it, I, well, I, I don't even remember. Dickie, I know who, we didn't know at the time. And I'm like, I'm an idiot. I knew. Well, yeah. that's, you know, that's it's tough to say you didn't know to somebody that pointed it out to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You didn't know. Well, you sound like a virologist at the time you're screaming at me for all the things I had to do. But as I said to the um, guy, I got interviewed by a, a show called The Doctors, and he was angry at me because I called everyone pussies and uh, said this thing kills old people. And, and sick people and the rest of you pussies got played in a tweet. That was that, the famous tweet, right? Right. And so he wanted to know what I meant by it. And then I told him, I, that I read the tweet. That's what I meant. And then I said, 
uh, walking on the beach and stuff like that. And he said, oh, we didn't know at the time. And I said, yeah. then shut up. If you don't know, <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of shit I don't know about, so I don't talk about it. He has I a don't... defiant looking for a new bongo player because Adam, yeah. I think Adam would fit fit in with you guys. There's always room for one more. Uh, picture yeah. if anyone saw the Partridge Family, <laughs> picture Tracy just standing up on the riser with the tambourine. <laughs> this you know, be Tracy hey. adjacent. Yeah, yeah. Adam, I'm the guy who had a dancer, so anything goes. With that. <laughs> I love right. that. <laughs> I love the dancer from the Boston's. Oh, you with Bongos greatest. would be the best. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Yeah, we won't we won't mic me up. I oh, mean, didn't, Fonzie play, didn't yeah. Fonzie play Bongos and they and he made him put him in the band with Richie and Ponzi and Ralph? And, it, and then he had to do a solo and the solo was atrocious. Am I wrong? Yes. If you'd gotten the if you'd taken the vax, you'd know that that never happened. <laughs> uh, did uh so what was all right so how much of covid for you guys was i've read up on the studies and i don't think it would be a good idea for me to take an experimental vaccination versus what i was doing was more like how about you stop trying to bully me into a bunch of shit and go mind your own fucking business? I wasn't really going, this is dangerous. This is safe. My approach to it was, how about you leave me the fuck alone? That, that was my approach. Like I was pushing back on the push. Not, I didn't have a bunch of facts. I was more like, I'm none of your business. So keep walking. Yeah, I could see that. But I mean, you're you're kind of your own boss, you know, at other people in different situations like you. We, we have to we can't take that approach. We have to answer to things and we try to present information. We try to present our uh, life experience and our personal examples of, hey, I don't think this is good for me. My doctor says it's not right for me. And, you know, you kind of got to approach it that way unless, you know, unless you're running the show and you're the boss, then yeah, you can say whatever the hell you want, tell everyone, just leave you alone. So I, I would say I started more of like, hey, I've done this research and here's where I'm at and kind of got after at the end of all of it, got to just leave me the hell alone. You know, um, not nobody should be forced to be to do this. But, so um, I understand your point. Let's uh, just kind of see if we're all on the same page with the vax in general. And I've, I've talked to Dr. Drew about this uh, quite a bit which is if you're old and you're in a nursing home or you're just old or you have a bunch of pre-existing conditions, then do it. Um, and if you're thin and young, then don't do it. Is that where you guys are landing or are you in the don't do it all the way across the board? Um, I'm in the I'm do, do whatever you you feel is right for yourself camp. You know, I, I think everybody, it's a personal choice what you want to do as far as medical issues go. And, and I always land on that regardless of whether my issue is, you know, coming from a, a medical standpoint, like, Hey, this is contraindicated for me, but I don't think anybody should be forced to take it. Uh, sorry, Dickie, go ahead. That's okay. I, I, I didn't like the feeling of, you know, of if you're old and your, your health is compromised and, and you have other, you know, illnesses. I didn't like the fact that I had to take a vaccine for you. Right. That didn't seem right. For me, you know, I, I I smelled the rat the whole time. I didn't like the feeling of it, uh, of that or or any of the, the vaccines I'm not crazy about, to be quite honest. And that's been a long time for me. And and it's not I didn't just go uh, flip a coin on that. I did look into it. And, I, and And that's the way I feel. So what ultimately for me, Adam, was. I knew that they were Boston's fans that were looking, you know, I didn't want to be a cheeseburger. I didn't want to be, well, you know, Dickie did it. I didn't want to be somebody's reason. Now, you know me, I've done a lot of stupid stuff. Yeah. And some of it, some of it's at your house, <laughs> but, but so I'm, I wasn't afraid of it. I wasn't, but I couldn't signal that way. I didn't want to say, Hey, you know, if you want to see the Boston's or, if, you know, your favorite ska singer look at me look what i did because because i didn't i felt like it was dangerous and and i think the verdict is coming in every day more and more each day proving so and, and at the very least everything was handled poorly everything was bad you know there's businesses when 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 you know were shut down 
completely like like family businesses long term small businesses were shut down alcoholism way up people that have you know were in the programs started drinking the suicide rate check those numbers and then while you're checking those numbers you know check who prospered who made money who who put who, you know whose bank accounts got went through the roof yeah so, so the, that yeah the question that i keep having for this particular chapter we're in in this country is and even the world is was this you know i always say stupid or liar stupid or liar yes how many of these people that. were stupid and then how many were lying and also why don't people understand when they're getting a message that doesn't make sense you know like the second I heard mask up in between bites, I, I started laughing and said, well, then then it's nothing. Then it's 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 nothing. But I was on I would scream to all the people around here. Like the second I heard Fauci being questioned, saying, well, OK, so churches are closed and ballparks are closed and sporting events and concerts are closed. What about Black Lives Matter marches? Is that a bad idea? And he's like, I, I, what, what do I know? I don't know anything. I was like, OK, this guy's. <laughs> I started screaming, he's compromised. I yelled at you a thousand times. Yep. I were driving to the Burbank mm -hmm. airport to do a gig, and I said, this guy is compromised. And everyone looked at me and went, oh, well, he's just giving his opinion or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, no, he's compromised. He's politically compromised. Something is wrong. I, I caught that every time I heard somebody go back like, oh, head of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky was saying she'd open schools, but then, oh, she walked it back because that was her just speaking as a mom, not as the head of the CDC, even though it was at a CDC function. I was like, okay, now she's compromised. Like I kept here, I kept getting little glimpses into people being compromised and I kept yelling at everyone, this guy's compromised, she's compromised. And everyone would sort of looked at me and went, she's the head of the CDC, leave her alone. You know, and I was like, <laughs> How come no one else is seeing this? How come I was seeing it, buddy? You saw it. I was seeing it. Fauci was con Fauci's had that job since Ronald Reagan. He's right. been doing that job. And you know, so his his basic job to simplify it is to is America's health. Have we gotten since Ronald Reagan, have we gotten healthier? No, we're fatter and we're, we're, we're dumber. Huge. We're dumber yeah, too. We're huge. And so so I put that as a fail, his career. And, and at the end of it, he became the highest paid government official in history. Yeah. So, so there, there you go. So, you know, to protect that. And then the, he was standing next to Trump, you know, pretending he was uncomfortable and pretending he knew something that Trump didn't know. And, it, and if, if you do know something that Trump didn't know, but you're standing there and, and not telling that, and people are dying, then 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 you're you're a liar, and and you're an asshole. So you know, how like much, it's his job to yeah. to tell the American people, hey, Trump is out of out of line here. This is irrational behavior. Whatever he's saying about this, he's crazy. But instead, he was making those faces and that kind of thing, and then move on to you, you know the the next administration, and he's still the same stuff. So so. You know, as far if you know, to answer your question, stupid or liar, we'll put Fauci in liar. Right. I think that the people that were telling people to put on the masks were liars. And I think that the people that were willingly and unknowingly putting on the mask, I'm going to put them as stupid. Yeah. All right. So, OK. It, yeah. No, it's it's a handful of liars. A handful that are manipulating masses of stupid people who weren't formally stupid, but the second they got scared, they got stupid. And Let me say this though: it, to be fair to them, not—I I don't mean stupid. I mean, I mean, like just ignorant to the facts. They're giving these facts, and and the, they don't know. So in that way, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I feel like I'm being cruel, calling everybody. We, you know, we didn't know. I think they didn't know. You know, so. Maybe ignorant to the facts is probably better to say and kinder. I don't know, because my feeling is, is be ignorant of the facts silently in shame. Don't go out and attack 
people. No, yeah, well, and, that, that, I'm not referring to them. And there was a lot of folks out there who were who had deemed them who essentially deputized themselves. They essentially okay. thought, "All right, I'm I'm not the sheriff, but I'm a deputy, and I'm just going to patrol La Cunada and wherever Carol is, and I'm going to school <laughs> him up." on masking <laughs> and everything else, even though I don't know shit. And for those people, I have no fucking pity for. And yeah. you should you should all be ashamed of your fucking self. I've got my eyeball on Barrett in the Pasadena area. <laughs> That's okay. right. You got... All right. Well, they didn't Watch stick it. to the neighborhood. They took over Twitter and, and right. Instagram as well. And oh. we're going to just shame everyone who won't get on board here because yeah. I've been told that I'm on the right side of this. So now I get to be a self-righteous asshole to everyone. So, and so contagious. Pete, um, I'm a big fan of all the bands you've been in. Like, I love Face to Face and Saves the Day, and then, of course, The Offspring. Uh, but could you tell us the story of the guys confronting you about um, ousting you from the band? Yeah, I mean, it, it really boiled down to a really terrible, abusive call that I got from their manager, um, who, you know, as far as I was concerned, we were trying to work this out, figure out some way to move forward. And he just made it very plainly clear that I was to get the shot or I was out, that I I was easily replaceable. There was no reason that they should be bothered to do anything special for me. Didn't matter that I'd been there for 14 years. Didn't matter that I'd, you know, ate every plate of shit I'd ever been served. The first time I said no, I was out. So, I mean, it was a really shockingly horrible call. And, uh, you know, it felt abusive and threatening and, you know, I'm a pussy or I, I won't get on board for the greater good and this and that. And so, you know, I took it to the guys and I said, hey, you know, got this call. That was weird. And I'm a drummer. I'm used to managers hate drummers. You know, Dickie, <laughs> back me up here because we're, you know, <laughs> managers don't understand music. So they look at everybody except the singer like they're expendable, which is how this guy looked at me. And, you know, so when I took it to the guys and said, hey, this guy is you know, this was crazy. Like I've had shitty calls before, but this is off. This is out of line. And they backed him up. They backed him up, took his side. And I tried to present all kinds of different arguments um, for supporting my position. I had my medical exemption, didn't matter. Um, and so, you know, uh, after that, everything de-escalated really quickly. And, you know, I found out I was replaced because everyone just stopped speaking to me. And I they found were out close was, too. They were like their families were intertwined. Yeah, we were and, tight. Yeah. Fourteen years of traveling the world. Our families were tied. Our kids were tied. Our wives were all friends. And I found out I was replaced through my Southwest app. My flight to rehearsal disappeared, and then later on that day, um, my access to the band work calendar was revoked. And and that was that. Like that's you know just ghosted and uh, you know abandoned overnight because you know you said no to something that you know, that I knew wasn't right for me. And, you know, it, it felt like there was ways to work around this. I mean, I, they went out, you know, obviously I got replaced. They went right out on tour and I had bands hitting me up going, dude, we're playing the same festival as your old band. We're unvaccinated. Why are you not here? This is stupid. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's stupid. I, I tried to explain things. You know, I was called all kinds of crazy and then that was just it. And then just kicked to the curb. Well, in case you feel bad, and I'm disappointed because I, I consider Dexter a friend. I always uh, like the band. I always like Dexter, and I, I wish he would have stood up for you, and I guess you feel that way as well. I do. And the funny thing is the first show they played um, that I wasn't allowed to play with them was your Backyard Barbecue show. I know, and they were off. Oh, wait a minute. I was drunk. <laughs> it was something. And both, it, was both, both. it was both. It was definitely both. <laughs> but I I will say, if you want to feel better, it I, I do think that the guy from Mumford and Sons got jacked much worse than you. Dude, Winston's He's playing on the Defiant yeah. album. Yeah, he played Repeat. on a record. Oh, yep. he is. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's we great. got everybody. That this guy... <laughs> The guy who got fucked more than anybody, even in COVID, is the Just Mumford. Said I like a book. And the Mumford and Son <laughs> guy said, I like that book written by Andy, Andy No, no yeah. who just called out Antifa. Yeah. What, <laughs> what <laughs> world are we living in? Do you get dumped from a ban because you like that guy who wrote a book who got brain damage because Antifa beat the shit out of him? 
What the yeah, fuck? The, where, where are we living? What time the is it? Of What's rock going and roll on? Outlaws and bad boys. Oh and my the bad god! Guys and the black hats. Those those days are gone. It's oh. me, Pete, and Chris. I'm in the, the band. Bad guys of rock. Oh, oh, oh. I'm talking about you. I thought it's the right. name of the guy from Mumford. <laughs> <laughs> Him too. That is. <laughs> yeah. I now. So here's the difference. I guess I go insane when I hear these stories and. Everyone else sort of walks around and goes, like, well, shouldn't have read the book. You know, and I go, why aren't we going nuts all the time yeah. on this stuff? And they go, I don't know, just, just get, I don't know, just get the jab but that, and then it could go on tour. Like, right, I mean, we're it, indifferent. It goes to your thing, though. If, if we're, all, country. we're all self-censoring now because everyone's terrified of like, God, that guy liked a book and had to quit his band, got like, you know, scorched earth or that guy wouldn't get a vaccine he got the boot you know everybody's self-censoring now kind of afraid to even poke their head up like hey i don't feel so good about this why are we offering cheeseburgers and lap dances to get this vaccine that seems really weird but as soon as you do that you're you know you're kicked into the bad box and you know now you're every bad name in the book so, so it's yeah so i i have this kind of theory that things have a trajectory you know, and and so I'll get your opinions on this as far as the vax trajectory. But I always yell this at Dr. Drew, which is um, things have their own momentum. They have their own sort of trajectory, you know, so it's like you hear about some guy and he's some Hollywood producer guy and he had a thing. He cornered some woman at a party and dropped the digit on her and wanted him to watch him beat off into a ficus plant or something. And then someone will go, all right, just one woman saying one thing. We don't know if we should believe her. And I go, oh no, it's, it's now starting. It's, it's going to keep, it's going to keep going. And you know, Hunter Biden's laptop, let's, let's examine the trajectory of Hunter Biden. Uh, remember when the laptop was fake and it didn't exist? And then it went mm -hmm. to, yeah. well, he's a drug addict. There's some new, there's some dick pics on there, but that has nothing to do with Joe Biden. Then it went to, well, there's a couple of business memos up there with a couple of business yeah. partners. All right, that was two years ago. Let's really follow the trajectory of Hunter Biden. And then where are we going to be in two years from now when it, all the shit comes out, when you fucking know everything? All right, so this <laughs> it starts as... This is fake. It doesn't even exist. It didn't even happen. And, and also the timing of it, right? The, right. After all the election dust right. has settled. Right. Now it's it's from hell. Right, right. And so we will. And, and then, um, by the way, we're at the middle part of the trajectory. We, we, we just got to the middle. Every three days, there's something else, right? And it's good. And by the way. It's going to keep going. It's not going the other direction. It's not going, oh, all right, we're out of info. It'll it'll keep going as more people come together. Now, the vaccine, the trajectory of the vaccine was take it, you'll be safe. You can't spread it. You won't get it. Then it was, well, take it and take it periodically. Like, take it more than once, but you still, you won't get it and you can't spread it. Then it was, take it periodically periodically. You can get it, but you you can't spread it to other people. Then it was take it. You can get it, and you can spread it, but it's still better. It's a, you're you're better somehow. Then can we see where the trajectory is going from the very beginning, when all the fucking anchors and talking heads were screaming as you take it, it stops. You know Rachel Maddow and her infinite wisdom and all mm -hmm. the fucking Don Lemons and all the talking head shows yeah. for the drug companies. They said, take it, done. And by the way, according to CNN, 86% of Americans live with their grandparents. So somehow we were going <laughs> to... I would kill myself if I lived with Helen and Lotsi Gorak at any age. But the point is, is think My about the... one, Adam, is... is I, I, um, well, let's I got finish COVID. the trajectory. What, what's the trajectory? Oh, and then by the way, if you get COVID, you won't have natural immunity. You still yeah, need to I get think this is in the trajectory. Right. I got COVID, but when I got COVID, it would have been much worse. Right. If I didn't get the shot. How do you know that? Right. Yep. Right. So yeah, you can't prove a negative. Now it's maybe there's some negative side effects, and then let's shut all those people up. So where are we going in the Hunter Biden laptop? trajectory we're somewhere around the middle we haven't gotten to the end yet in the covid vax trajectory like where are we i think it's you know there's this new scary variant right 
terrifying everyone flying straight at us from Canada right now. It feels like any kind of side effects or bad things that they didn't talk about that are starting to show, that are starting to pile up. Now we can blame it all on this new variant. Everything can be swept under it's, you know, everything else was fine and perfect, but this new variant now that's causing all these problems. So guess what, everybody? Now get your mask on. Now lock back down. Now here's a whole new wave of vaccines because the Let first me make a prediction. Work, but these ones might, you know. I want to make a prediction. The new variant is going to cause blood clots and myocarditis. That's just mm. a prediction. Mm. I think it will. And you think an NFL player may collapse on the field? I think if that happens, hold on. New variant. New variant. Bronny yes. James. Well, what Bronny, do Bronny James may hit the hardwood at a USC practice. He's, he's before the new variant. I think with him, mm. I think that might have been uh, the laptop. He mm. dropped because of the laptop. Uh, or Yeah, one of those. So then you start to really like, wonder kind of what's going on, what period we're living in. Uh, everyone owes us an apology for COVID, but do I owe Ed Asner a posthumous <laughs> apology for calling him a nut job for believing in all these crazy conspiracy theories involving the U S because Ed Asner, and there's a handful of these guys, they're always like, you know, Kennedy was shot by the CIA and the Twin Towers were rigged with explosives. And I was like, all right, nut job. Okay, you know, Marilyn Monroe was killed by the Kennedys, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, okay, all right, keep walking, you know. But uh, then you got to look back and go, well, how much of this shit's been going on for how long? Do you know what I mean? Like when you start hearing about today's, CIA and FBI and DOJ, you go, okay, that's 10 minutes old and they're up to a lot of shit, but let's go back 50 years when, when you could Absolutely. get away with shit. Well, let's, let's not forget that Pfizer tried to keep all their data under wraps for 75 years right? on, on their trials for this vaccine too. Like why, why would you do that? You know? Okay. Cuckoo. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, your, I've, I've been told. Where's your tinfoil hat? Yeah, it is. It is, not. it is weird. Like the January 6th committee destroyed 200 gigabytes of material. Like, <laughs> why would you destroy findings from a committee? It's like, man, no reason. Need a room on the hard drive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm like in now, sadly. Like, I, I'm yeah. sadly bothered by all the shit that is going on simultaneously in this country. But I'm so glad you're in. I am. I loved you anyway, but I love you for being in. <laughs> but I still, but it, it can only work if you have an army of people who won't ask questions who appear to be most everybody. And the, and so the question is what the fuck is going on? Like, why aren't more people being just being genuinely curious about these sort of wild inconsistencies that we keep seeing over and over again. What's going on in Maui? Oh, that's another one, right? There we go. What's going on there? That's, that's pretty suspect. Well, what do I you think? think? All what? the alarms did. What do I think? I think somebody wanted people out of that part of the town. And, and I think Pete has some Maui history. I think his, his wife is from, from there or the, or they, Go there, I think. Um, but somebody wanted them out of that part of the town. Very valuable beachfront property that was owned by islanders and people that weren't willing to sell. And so, you know, but, but let me let me find my tinfoil hat because I know people are going, oh, Dickie. oh, all over the podcast. Well, can you can I say this? I mean, before you uh, run in and grab your tinfoil hat. Um, and I don't have a full tinfoil hat, but I have a tinfoil yarmulke, which covers, <laughs> it doesn't cover yeah, my whole head, partial. <laughs> but it's starting to grow. It's like a picture, a, yep. a yarmulke that grew like ivy. You know what I mean? It's Freddy. starting to make its way down the side of my head. But here's the problem. And here's, here's the real damage that was done during COVID. It wasn't, you know, and I've, 
I I said uh, uh, my saying from COVID is I didn't learn anything about viruses, but I learned a lot about people, and I'm yes. fucking worried. Number one, but the part the damage that COVID caused is me hearing that the head of the CDC recommends this, or me hearing that the head of the WHO recommends that, or hearing that the FBI has found this and done that. And I used to just sit back and go, well, that's what happened. Because the the FBI and the CIA found this or did that, and the head of the CDC said to do this, so I'm going to do that. I now question everything. Which is sad. It's a, you know, why would you want that relationship? Why, you know, my son came home and I said, where were you, boy? And he was like, I went to In-N-Out Burger and then I played soccer. Did you? (laughs) Are you sure? And that's exhausting. Let me see your feet. Let me smell your hands. They don't smell like onions. Uh, (laughs) Along the the same lines and, and, and one of my favorite things that you say about all of this is, now we don't have to believe them anymore. The convenience of that, like, okay, you said that. Now I no longer have to listen to what you say, and you can and you file people in boxes that way. That, that's my favorite stuff. So right, yeah. yeah. Would you it's listen l- to anything Fauci, Rochelle Walensky, or even you know Anderson Cooper or whoever the Rachel Maddow? Like, do we have to listen to them about anything anymore? For yeah. laughs. Okay, you know. for shits and giggles. <laughs> shits and giggles we can. So they, uh, we need to take a break, but I want to come back and hear the Maui conspiracy theory <laughs> since I'm now open to any conspiracy. And we'll take a quick break. Be back with Dick and Pete right after this. Morgan and Morgan, let me lay a stat on you. People, 15 to 24 of the highest rate of ER visits due to car accidents. And uh, I got kids, and they're about that age, so it seems, well, they're right in that age group. It's kind of scary. So if you've ever been injured, check out Morgan & Morgan. Submitting a claim with Morgan & Morgan is easy. Uh, You can use it the same way you use, like, a rideshare app. It is that easy. And even easier than swiping right on a dating app, which, by the way, leads to more trouble or... This could lead to more money. America's largest injury law firm, 100 plus offices nationwide, over 800 lawyers, more than 15 billion recovered for clients. So if you're injured in an accident, check out Morgan and Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. So it's no risk. Morgan and Morgan, right, Dawson? For more information, go to ForThePeople.com slash Adam or dial pound law, pound 529. From your cell phone, that's F-O-R, ThePeople.com slash Adam or pound law, pound 529 from your cell. This is a paid advertisement. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey. Follow-up question on the Grand Funk Railroad. So the hotel detective was out of sight. It's the 70s. Do they? Does that mean he was really, really good? Out of sight? Out of sight. Or was he out of sight? Like, we can sneak them in. He's out of sight. Question. Always wondered. Thanks. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. And then what about that George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez movie, Out of Sight, from 1996? What were they referring (laughs) to? I'll tell you the answer to that really quick. The answer is both. Both? That's unsatisfying. Yeah, it's both. (laughs) He was not in sight. That's what they mean. But the reason why they said out of sight is because it's out of sight. Yeah. How are you like, privy to this information, Dawson? Dickie knows, too. It's just <laughs> it's inherent. We know this. Uh, Dickie thinks the Obama set the Maui say, fire. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you how I know. Have, he wouldn't have said out of sight if it wasn't 1974. All right, go ahead, Dickie. I'll tell you how I know. Because I was out on the road for 40 days. Mm. Ah, yeah. Last night in Little Rock put me in a haze. I was feeling good, feeling right. It was Saturday night. Wait, with sweet, 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 Con- Connie, sweet, sweet Connie was doing her act. Don't confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so- uh, what a great song, though, huh? The oh. classics. The kids don't know the classics. No, they don't. They don't know how good that stuff was. 
and is. Oh, it was great. So can- um, Pete is well versed on on all things Maui. My and, wife um, is well versed on all things Maui. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let me go get her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, what about what was the, the conspiracy theory? Was they didn't sound the alarm. But then people said, well, they didn't sound the alarm because they thought that it would be a tsunami and people would head up to higher ground where the fire was. All right. Semi-reasonable. And then there's some weird theory about the guy who was a conservationist, whatever, didn't want to give up the water to fight the fire, which that seems weird. And then there was a lot of discussion about, you know, maintain your grasslands and maintain your power poles and stuff like that, which, of course, they... They never do, but then they talk about climate all the time yep. instead of maintaining things. Yeah, one of the big issues there is that, you know, where Lahaina was located is away from the main touristy area with all the hotels and stuff. And the problem with Hawaii is they're always rerouting the water away from the regular area to make sure that it goes to the tourist areas. And so it's was very dry there right now where it shouldn't have been. I mean, it's Hawaii. It's supposed to be lush and beautiful. And, you know, when you're, they're always having water issues there, fighting the, for their water rights. It's getting rerouted towards the hotels and the tourist stuff. And, it, and as far as conspiracies and stuff go, however this started and however it shakes out, it's to me, it's just sad that, you know, either way, the developers in that area are getting what they want, you know, the, the the people it's going to take too long for insurance to come in there's already insurance coming in and saying oh we're not going to pay this they're saying oh you had a um like a lien on your property or there there's all kinds of weird stuff that people are saying is happening from insurance companies and now the developers get to come in for pennies on the dollar and scoop all this stuff up and you know so regardless of how it started the the people that lived there their whole lives, like family owned homes and stuff, who didn't want to sell, they didn't want any more commercialization going on. You know, it's kind of taken out of their hands now, which is, you know, regardless of how it started, that's just the most depressing part. It's just devastating for that community. Um, for not only while they're grieving the loss of such a huge portion of that city, they're also being hit from all sides from you know, greedy people trying to take advantage and get a deal at the same time. And well, to me, that's the saddest part. The good news, Agreed. the good news is they have one of the greatest minds in politics, Maisie Hirono, <laughs> who's the sharpest. She's the sharpest politician. I mean, whew, she, if anyone can fix this problem, it's going to be Maisie Hirono, <laughs> who sounds to me I don't even want to make fun of retarded people, but I don't, and I don't know if retarded people drink a lot, but when she talks, she sounds like a full <laughs> retarded person who just drank a fucking six pack of tall boys. Like she's the dumbest person I've ever heard speak. And she's, she's inspirational in the sense that if you listen to her speak, Everyone thinks they could now be in politics. Like there's no, there's no little girl who suffers from a learning disorder and has a ten cent brain who can can't say that I cannot be in politics now because she is officially the dumbest person I've ever heard speak. Um, Pete, yep. um, drumming for uh, lots of cool bands sounds like I really the greatest, most visceral job in the world but maybe not devo <laughs> i knew you were gonna do that i knew it i don't i, I, love dis- I, I don't dislike i don't dislike devo i love devo so much but i don't know if i like them <laughs> those guys were so fun though like i didn't know what to expect any any moment of the day like mark mother's ball would walk in backstage and like be wearing a giant flowered muumu that he just picked up at Goodwill because he was just feeling like he he needed a muumu that day, and then put on a weird mask and a bowler hat and went on stage like that that night. You know, just kind of bizarre stuff happened all the time, and you you didn't know when it was coming. We, one of the shows, he brought out a bag of flour and just at the end of the show threw it all over the first few rows of people who were all sweaty and hot from. <laughs> you know, a couple hours of music. And so now they're all just caked in white flour. And he was just, just delighted. 
With, you know, <laughs> Some so. of the audience were gluten free, so it was a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was. It was, a lot of, it was a lot of losses. Is uh, are are the Devo guys just sort of weird all the time? Not all of them, but you know, a, a few. I mean, Mark is is kind of weird all the time, and I think he enjoys that. I think he gets a kick out of keeping people on their toes. Like he's he's entertaining himself regardless of what everyone else has going on. Um, What's your they, favorite Devo song, Pete? I liked playing Jocko Homo the best. As far as drumming, like the, the drums in that song are, are just really oh, bizarre. So good. And so even good. the the Satisfaction beat, you know, where they did the, the Stone song. Oh, my God. And it's so oh, weird. staccato and they were like, st- st- Satisfaction. Yeah, but they even they were like, yeah, we've been playing this song for decades and like they're they would still turn around to me looking for the one. And I'm like, oh, man, you guys do this all the time. And they're like, OK, yeah, they're OK. Yep, that's it again. All right. Like just kind of checking in because it's it's a mind, you know, it's a crazy thing to kind of play something so simple, but make sure that you don't mess up any part of it because the whole thing will will derail in a hurry. So their stuff was really fun. Because as, as featured in the movie Casino, right? Yeah. Sa- satisfaction? Yes, you're right. It wasn't that. Yeah. Devo's. Scorsese likes Devo, but you don't like Devo. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't dislike them. Uh-huh. I, I just feel like there's a lot of bands out there. There's only so much time. And I like, I, you know, in, in a weird way, I, I, I kind of looked at, Oingo Boingo as a sort of more evolved version of Devo when I was out here in the eighties and K rock was, was playing, playing Oingo Boingo, which was a, a weird band from the eighties. They're both like sort of, we had sort of, we had the B 52s Oingo Boingo had only a lad. You guys remember that? Only a lad was a great Mm -hmm. song. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was it yeah. was and then we had Devo and I'm trying to think of who the other sort of novelty Oh, the tubes. Sim- the tubes were tubes. Yeah. Always always kind of there was there was sort of weird novelty bands, but they had to have a hook. Like Devo had hooks because it wouldn't work without the without the hook. And uh the I remember were my fun. father yelling uh in like nineteen seventy eight, like, Dick, get in here. <laughs> and he was watching Saturday Night Live. And he's like, what am I looking at right here? <laughs> Devo playing Satisfaction. He couldn't get his brain around it. And I was I was thrilled. I'm like, this is the greatest. And from there, I was hook, line, and sinker into Devo. And the, and the guitars in Devo rock, Adam. They, it's just great stuff. I agree with you on Oingo Boingo, but there's room for both. All right. All right. <laughs> the, and Oingo- are, you, are, you, are you still going to fight to keep them out of the... Uh, did they get in the Hall of Fame this year? Eagles? Well, no. listen, here's the deal. I'm no longer fighting to get people in. I now want people out. I want Joan Jett out. <laughs> I want Joan Jett out. That hack, that's all affirmative action. It's 100% affirmative action for her. There's no way. She's got one shit. She's got two shitty songs. They're both, both covers. Blah. Okay, so. I, I Bad reputation's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, but that's a song that you could have written at 16 with your garage band, you know. I don't know. I hate Joan Jett. Uh, Joan but Jett's cool. I'm sure she's nice. <laughs> it's, this is, <laughs> these aren't personal things. Like, I, I don't... I The don't, manager, Kenny Lagoon, is a nice guy. He really is. He's a sweetie. You'd like him, Adam. Listen, I... I think he actually wrote... I think he actually wrote uh, Crimson and Clover. No. All right. See the way he plays Cowbell on stage? <laughs> I yeah, I play some keyboards too. Listen, I wrote a book. In it, I mentioned that "Stuck with You," you know, by Huey Lewis in the News, is just one of the shittiest songs ever made. And um, what did you, Jimmy say? Uh, he put me and Huey together at a party, and we had to we had to talk <laughs> it out, you know. And and Huey is the nicest guy in the world, of course. Oh, Dicky Dicky knows this for sure. And like my thing is always like, look, you're a great guy, and the song sucks. Like it's it's both. It can be both. 
Now, it's yeah. not, is that your fault? Everyone writes shitty songs, but yours was foisted on me via the, the radio, and that's why I'm, I'm angry. I'm angry I'm, that I know the words to it. I'm more like you. <laughs> Everybody was listening to Huey Lewis uh, you know, in the country, and I was listening to Graham Parker. Oh, God bless you. We have a little follow-up business because uh, Darius Rucker was uh, in here from uh, Hootie, of course, that you guys know. But Yeah, of course. Um, but I was early money on the trip, uh, the double diamond, 20 million units selling cracked rear view because I'm like, that's a John Hyatt line, which they did take it from that song. Uh, but now we have the, the chorus. Sorry. There that's the song and i love that line and i always loved it and i was sitting around listening to john high and graham parker and Devo yes for the sake of this conversation <laughs> do you guys do you guys have a name for your for your upcoming album yes i love that band Good. yeah okay Stick great with it. <laughs> yes. that's it no follow-ups there <laughs> can you give it out yet I don't want to. All right. <laughs> We're going to give it out. It'll, it'll, it's, Why bother it's not, being it's not yeah. mind-blowing or earth-shattering. I'll tell you off the air, Chris. <laughs> what John that, Hyatt song you know, did you rip it from? Yeah, I really don't want that kind of trouble. Um, <laughs> but the date, the release date's going to be October? It's in October, yes. What's the exact date, Pete? October 27th. Well, you know what Huey <laughs> Lewis does, which is interesting... Now, I don't know if this, you guys are musicians, tell me. But uh, Stuck With You, is it's just a bad, it's a nursery rhyme. It's just a nursery rhyme. It should have never gotten it. Now, when I talk to Huey, he always goes, he picks a good song or a better song. And he goes, I know, I know, you hate hip to be square. And I go, no, no. No, that song's fine. I'm talking about the shitty song. And he always, every time I see him every three years, he inserts a good song there, which makes, which makes me an asshole, but gets him off the hook. <laughs> he's reminding you subtly. Yeah, but he's reminding me the better version of, a, of Huey Lewis in the news, which makes me seem sort of like an idiot. It's a nice defense. It's a good, subtle defense. All right. You guys want to hang out for 10 minutes? We'll do a couple news stories. Yeah. Yes. All right. Let's, Chris, what time is it? Let's do it. 2.40. Thank you. He needs to pick up his kids. Oh, you got to pick up your kids. Are you in, Ari <laughs> are you in Arizona, Dickie? <laughs> yes, I am, sir. How are you liking it there? I I love it. I love being here. Oh, got to get out of this but, I mean, it's not Boston where my heart is, but my kids and uh, my ass are in Arizona, and I love it. That's another good lyric. <laughs> My ass is in Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> and I love it. Arizona. Zona, kick off your underpants. Your <laughs> Arizona. You know, that was the, uh, yes, I do. His name's uh, the guy from Paul Revere and the Raiders. Yeah, that's uh, the Paul Revere and the Raiders guy. Um, he, he, Eric. Um, Shit. I, I can't remember that guy's name. No, oh, we've gotten old. Our, our brains are gone. But, you know, that's the, that song was the answer. To all of those songs, like, uh, are you going to, to San, San Francisco? Everybody was going to San Francisco, or you got to be here, you got to be there. People are tuning in and turning on, and and uh, all of those sort of hippie songs. And then Eric, then uh, he wrote um, Arizona, which is, if you listen to the lyrics, it's uh, take off your rainbow shoes. Uh, yeah, or shades. Off, Shades and take off your Indian braids. Right, right. Arizona. And it's all, he's a very conservative guy. Oh, is he? Come, yeah, come back to Arizona. Check the lyrics out. It's pretty great. I wonder Pull if, them up there, Chris. I wonder if there were any other contenders. Like he was sitting around working out the song going, You Kaipa, come down to heaven. Something <laughs> Arizona was the perfect alliteration, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. All couple, right. Uh, couple news stories. Did we come back from break? <laughs> no. Okay. Mm. okay. Do you, you want to break? Do you, nah, yeah. I'm told we don't need to break. We don't need one. Okay. Let me tell you about O'Reilly Auto Parts. Wow. You want to save some money? You want to save some gas? Here's a few things you can do to improve your fuel mileage. Check your tire pressure, people. If the tire pressure is low and one or more tires, 
you're going to use a lot more gas. Check out your owner's manual or inspect the tire yourself to find the recommended pressure. O'Reilly Auto Parts carries a wide range of tire gauges to make it easy to check your tires on a regular basis. It's also a lot safer when they're properly inflated. Always keep your fuel system clean. A fuel injector or carburetor cleaner is a simple, affordable way to remove carbon deposits and moisture from the fuel system and can improve the performance and efficiency of your engine. How about changing a clogged air filter? As an air filter clogs with dirt and debris, airflow becomes restricted and cause your vehicle's fuel management system to use more gas. Changing clogged filters increases the amount of air available to your engine, which boosts your fuel economy. For all the money-saving gas tips you need this summer, ask the professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts or go to O'ReillyAuto.com. Um, all right. Do you want to do you want to do anything with the uh, debate la- or I guess last week or well Vivek Ramaswamy's coming on tomorrow tomorrow so uh, oh nice I kind of yeah. liked uh, what he had to say uh, all right there's a clip that I I know you would love yes he spoke on school choice and teachers union so why don't we just Ugh. hear that yes Mr Ramaswamy hold on Senator Scott you've said that the Department of Education the FBI the ATF the Nuclear Regulatory Commission the IRS the Department of Commerce many of these should not exist that's correct so to the education question how would you deal with the crisis so look we have a crisis of achievement let's shut down the head of the snake the Department of Education take that 80 billion dollars put it in the hands of parents across this country this is the civil rights issue of our time allow any parent to choose where they send their kids to school and the teachers unions at the local level to allow public schools to compete well there you go yeah he speaks with ferocity yeah uh, uh dicky froze up. dicky froze up but your face was in a good shape dicky right. so <laughs> don't worry about it um, <laughs> the civil rights issue of our time. I listen. I, I was screaming about education and family and family and education, and school choice and vouchers and fucking mobbed up the school unions and teachers unions shutting down schools. I, it's in, it's it's insane. And all everyone does is argue with me. I it's 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 mind numbing to me when I went on. Oh. All those years ago, when I went on HuffPo TV, you know, oh, yeah. 10, 15 years ago, and I was like, family and education, oh, it can't be that simple. Family and education, well, what about the school to prison pipeline? I was like, I what is it? I, I, don't, I don't get it. It's just education and fucking families. That's it. You don't want to judge. Tough shit. Life is going to judge the shit out of these people. You, you don't want to judge for 10 minutes. Wait till life kicks in. Life never stops judging you. Fucking press. Oh, school. Oh, we have. We have me and uh, that's all I've ever said because I did Love Line for all those years and everyone was fucked up because they didn't have a dad and they didn't go to school. Like, that's it. I didn't give you a good answer as to perhaps what he thought maybe some of the systemic causes are that he had zero, he had zero know, minority groups in, uh, you know, in, in positions where they are more likely to live in poverty and. I basically, and I, no, I gave him the answer, which is family and education, and we can all get out of this mess. And he said it was much more complicated than that. But then, that is a little more complicated than that than just saying family and education. Not, not much. <laughs> oh, but come on. I mean, it's, it's a system, right, where if you, it is much harder to get out of a certain income bracket if you're born into it. If you live in a certain neighborhood, right. that that's, affects the that's quality. But that's why you have to focus on family and education. But I mean, I'm not, not gonna, Christian or you're anything. You're not going to solve everything. It would solve everything, yeah. Just family and education? What about, uh, you know, the, the drug war that we have that's failing? What think, about the, the school-to-prison pipeline, things well, like this? The school-to-prison pipeline, if you focused on education, I think would interrupt the school-to-prison pipeline. Well, the problem is that Unless schools they're physically are, well, yeah, a pipeline. schools are maybe not focusing on education so All much right. as they are. This fucking bitch is gone. Whatever. This is 15 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> but I said if unless there's physically a pipeline that is sucking the black babies into prison, that that then would need to be interrupted. But if there's no action, if it's a metaphor for family education, not being educated, then yeah, yeah, Vivek Ramaswamy. But family and education is just diet and exercise. It's just it just is. It's just it's just what there. It's just what there is. That's all there is. Yeah, there's no way to profit off that though. You know. So. Yeah, I I get. 
I get what's going on. Like, I understand what's going on, but I live in California, and these guys in California vote for people who are against school choice every single year and then complain. And and then um, talk about how much they love the little black and brown kids. And I'm like, why are you voting for the people who don't want this? And like, but that's because that's how we vote. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a sad part. It's not again. It's just like COVID. It's not the powers that be. It's all the little fucking lemmings who are just running behind them. That's the part that's curious to me. But well, everything's right. been so divided, though. Like everything is take a side on this or that. So there's no one splitting their ticket voting anymore. It's like, well, I'm I'm part of this party. I will vote party line on everything, and no one has to give any critical thought to anything. No one has to make up their own mind on an issue. It's just, well, this is what I, I'm I'm on this team, so this is what I believe, and you know that's yeah. how we get stuck here. Scary. Uh, yeah. All right, so Did Vivek you, will be on. Hopefully. Yeah, he had. Quite the performance. Everyone said he was the most dominating. He accused everybody else of being bought. He said uh, Donald Trump was the greatest president of the 21st century. And um, and he also said that we should uh, not be putting our money in the Ukraine, but worry about the borders. So, Actually, Ace, I'm not sure if you watched it, but his final statement was we could solve all these problems with family and education. He oh, really? He specifically said that. Oh, well, now you got to find that clip. Uh, yeah, the... the the thing that I don't really get is the circle talker era that I always call that we're in right now. It's mm-hmm. just this sort of when you hear, I mean, I, I, I guess the leader in the clubhouse would be Kamala Harris, but you know, Oprah's just a circle talker too. And Michelle it's like Obama they speak with dead language. Yeah. <laughs> nice. They're sur- they don't say anything. I, I don't know why that's attractive to a large percentage. And then Vivek Ramaswamy, or it was like, or even, you know, RFK Jr., where you, you just go, oh, look, you can say whatever you want about the guy, but he's fucking sharp. He's sharp. Vivek Ramaswamy is fucking sharp. These other people s- sound like dullards. Like, they sound like idiots. Why? Why would you vote for an idiot? And then like, nah, I like what she said about everybody having a seat at the table. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I know, but they never create the table or the seats. And they're like, yeah, but she said that no child should be left behind. Also, an interesting note about the debate last night is another guest that we're having on tomorrow, Tucker Carlson. He's, he's simulcasted an interview with Donald Trump, a long form interview with Donald Trump, who obviously wasn't there during the debate. And got like this, what, like over 250 million views right away. Yeah, well, I've said this uh, once and I'll, I'll say it again. Tucker Carlson has something to say. So he left his network the same time Don Lemon left his network. And they were basically equal, but on the other sides of the aisle. You know, we got one guy on Fox, you got one guy on CNN, and all the entertainment shows are like, Don Lemon and, and Tucker, Tucker Carlson. Carlson or they, Tuck, were the, they were the same version of each Tucker other. Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon. And then I got on this microphone and I said, Tucker Carlson will be fine because he has something to say. Uh, Don Lemon shall not be fine because he doesn't have anything to say. And we're treating them like, though, they're the same person. No, no. Don Lemon is going to be hanging out with the guy who used to host The Bachelor. Because he has nothing to fucking say. I don't get why people don't understand who people are. And Tucker Carlson is going to do more ratings than Fox did. And Don Lemon will sort of end up somewhere that nobody really cares about. And then there'll just be a slow decline. Yeah. Because he doesn't have anything to say. You called it. And yeah, he's thriving right now on uh, X or Twitter. But you know who do have something to say? Hmm. The Defiant. Hmm. Oh, is that us playing a clip? Or? I don't know. I just, I, just oh, tra- okay. I thought we'd button it up. All right, stop being a wordsmith. <laughs> uh, wait, we have a Vex uh, fam- uh, closing statement here. There are two genders. Fossil fuels are a requirement for human prosperity. Reverse racism is racism. An open border is not a border. Parents determine the education of their children. The nuclear family is the greatest form of governance known to man. Capitalism lifts us up from poverty. Yeah. Yeah. 
and then Intense. every dingbat in fucking LA is going to go I don't I don't like that one guy's hair so I and I wouldn't rather I don't want to have a beer with that guy Vivek Ramaswamy I'd rather have a beer with Gavin Newsom mm. so and I'm like can we just focus on the policies people nobody's having a beer and who cares what his hair looks like oh such a sad state of affairs Dickie uh, Dickie's, <laughs> Dickie's oh he's muted he's you're muted Dickie Dickie's muted he's still might muted. be a decent name for the band too muted <laughs> muted alright let me give everyone a, a plug including uh, hey I'm back oh there Dickie's back Dickie, we're just <laughs> we're just checking out. I, I I hope I can see you soon on the road or in L.A. or when we get to Arizona or something like that. Yes, for sure. I love hanging out with you. I love being around you, buddy. You guys will be very touring very soon, smart right? stuff. You guys will be touring yes. soon. We should be good. We'll come out around October. All right, we will we will come out and see you for sure. Uh, Pete, great to speak to you, my friend. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great talking to you guys. Uh, Darius Rucker, of course, that album, his album is coming out. Carolyn's Boy, that's coming out available for pre-order now, but October 6th. And of course, um, the Defiance album, pre-order that now. Let's do it now. It's coming out October, middle October. When was it? I can't remember. October 27th. October 27th. So uh, pre-order both those albums. Go to their website, thedefiantofficial.com for more info. Thedefiantofficial.com. Thank you. Uh, great seeing you fellas go to amcrow.com for all the live shows all over the place until next time this is Adam for Darius and Dickie and Pete saying mahalo mahalo